If you enjoy Jerusalem Unplugged, you may also like to listen to Stories from Palestine podcast. My name is Crystal. I am originally from the Netherlands. I am married to a Palestinian and I live in Beit Safafa between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. I studied history and tour guiding and I produce a weekly podcast called Stories from Palestine. You can find it on your favorite podcast player or go to the website storiesfrompalestine.info. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today it's with great pleasure that my guest is Catherine Pangonis. Catherine is the author of a newly released book, Queens of Jerusalem, The Women Who Dare to Rule. Catherine, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Catherine, this is a fascinating book because amongst the thousands of books dedicated to Jerusalem, there are very few of them dedicated to women and certainly dedicated to queens. Now, my first question is, how did you get to work on the queens of Jerusalem? And just to clarify, here we're talking about the queens of the medieval period, so of the crusader world. Yeah, exactly. So I'm writing about the queens, um, the queens who ruled Jerusalem between 1099 and 1187, and also their female relatives who played key roles in governing surrounding states, the Principality of Antioch, the County of Edessa, and the County of Tripoli as well. And I also draw some parallels between women in the Islamic world at the court of Damascus. Um, so yeah, I came to study this because actually it goes all the way back to my school days because I did the Crusader period in A-level, which is the British high school history diploma sort of thing. And what I remember when I studied this topic, I was fascinated by the Crusades and the world of medieval Jerusalem and the multicultural nature of the society and the different conflicts and intrigues going on. And we came across the names of Melisande of Jerusalem, Sibylla of Jerusalem, Alice of Antioch, but there really wasn't much opportunity to study them more deeply on the A-level syllabus. Um, then, you know, I went off to universities, studied other things and specialized in the medieval period during my masters and in the Crusades and literature of the Crusades. And when I finished my masters, I realized that there still wasn't a good accessible book about these women and that the syllabus still largely focused on the deeds of men and both in high school and, you know, in most of the work written for public consumption. And there just seemed to be a big gap in the market and a need to redress this and to write women back into the historical narrative. So that I, that was sort of the challenge. And yeah, I did my best. To, I did my best to meet it with this book. I want to start with the end of your book, where you basically make the point that, and I'm just quoting briefly, that the historical legacy of women rulers is subject to a variety of unpredictable forces. Each of the women discussed in this book has received very different treatment at the ends of historians from the 12th century to the 21st century. And essentially, you're making the point that most of the women have either disappeared or been neglected from historiography or not really given their place in history. And most of your book is to somehow to do right to, to them. And I think this is very common. As an historian, I can certainly say that there are plenty of women uh, in history, but we know very little about them. I just want to start with an exception because it's the place where I grew up. I grew up in North of Italy, very close to a, a small castle known as the Castello di Canossa, Canossa Castle. And this figure, Matilde di Canossa, or in English also known as Matilde of Tuscany, which played an important role between the papacy and the king of England in the, uh, the, the, the 11th century. We know a lot about her, but it's also true that she was not really in charge. She was not really a ruler. She just played sort of the middleman or the middlewoman between this very powerful figure. So she received a different kind of treatment. But here we're talking about women in power. And uh, you rightly say that they've been forgotten and essentially treated sometimes uh, badly or completely neglected. So I was wondering, what is that you're trying to do with the book about these women? What's the ultimate goal about your work? 
Oh, thanks. I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. And Matilda of Tuscany is a towering icon in my, my medieval education. So great that you brought her up. But yeah, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at a period of history that is familiar, you know, that has been written a lot about the Crusades and really write the women in and take them out of the shadows. I mean, the, the information about these women is scattered in a lot of the history books that exist, but in, there isn't a one place where it's all been pulled together in a clear and coherent narrative that also weighs up the different prejudices and factors that have affected how the history of these women has been written. So, you know, most of the history in the medieval period, most of the primary sources written by, by Latin chroniclers is written by churchmen. And that brings in with it um, a certain baggage of sort of patriarchal views. And, you know, the word is a bit anachronistic here, but, you know, also some, some elements of misogyny, which just mean that the women are considered less interesting. What they're doing is considered less important. Um, so in that sense, a lot of the sources do gloss over the roles women have been playing and also that there's a sense of that women who not women are often invested with authority in the medieval periods they're often they can often inherit authority they're often used as conduits for power but it's very rare that they're actually allowed to convert their authority into actual power to actually rule with the power that they've been given um, by the patriarchal structures in place and when they do it can often be considered a threat um, so women like Alice of Antioch have been much maligned in the chronicles and you know I'm certainly not making the case that Alice of Antioch is an exemplar of a sort of moral ruler or a perfect mother, but she doesn't deserve to be to be lambasted by historians the way that she has. And, and modern historians often follow the lead of medieval ones. So if William of Tyre said that Alice was manipulative or wily, then mod, even very eminent modern historians have followed suit and have called her silly and flighty and these very gendered adjectives. And I just wanted to remove those from the dialogue and actually peel back the layers of value judgments that have been put onto the careers of these powerful women and just look at the facts. So as we can establish them of what they did, how they ruled um, and what their lives were like and present that in a hopefully a less biased way um, to the public. I'm just wondering about your sources and you mentioned William of Tyre which is ever present in your book. Can you give us a sense of uh, who was uh, William of Tyre and what kind of information we can get out of uh, him and how did he sort of uh, shape your work? Well, William of Tyre is the key source really for any, any historian using written evidence to explore the world of the Latin East in the 12th century. He's a phenomenal historian and I think very ahead of his time and his approach because he not only, you know, he intersperses sort of eyewitness accounts and, you know, good textual research with big picture analysis of the movements and the events that are going on in the East at this time. So he's, he's fascinating and he's brilliant. And he has, he has quite a nice turn of phrase. He writes in a very engaging way. Um, and he also is a, he's a good source of even older history as well. Whenever he writes about a new city, he gives us an overview of how the med of how at least medieval scholars understood the history of that city. So that's been very useful in my, my new book about medieval cities as well. But yeah, William of Tyre is perfectly placed to be the historian for the, for the course of the Latin East. He's born and raised in Jerusalem. He's educated at the school of the, the Cathedral School of the Holy Sepulchre, and then goes on to continue his education in Europe in Paris and Bologna. At various points, he serves as an ambassador to the Byzantine Empire from the Crusader States. He also serves as the Chancellor of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Archbishop of Tyre, also the tutor to the Prince of Jerusalem, King Amalric's eldest son, Baldwin IV. And he also serves as the court historian. So he's, he writes his, his chronicle, Deeds, A History of Deeds Done Beyond the Sea, um, originally as in his role as court historian. So he has, you know, a very interesting viewpoint he's immersed in the action he's describing and he has access to a lot of a lot of people who can give him first-hand information about the events that have gone on and he's he's writing in the middle and late middle mid to late mid to late 12th century so there are some survivors from the earlier parts of the latin states he can talk to and he does his research quite thoroughly you know there's one very charming episode in his chronicle when he describes trying to get to the bottom of a sort of um a bloodlines dispute about how closely people were related with regards to a marriage and so in order to find out he has to he pays a visit to this elderly elderly nun um in a convent adjoining the holy sepulchre and he sits down with her in the cloisters and discusses it and before she took the veil she was part of this noble family um from the county of edessa and so she cast back her memory to remember which aunt was married to who and things like that so he's 
he's really he's going out of his way to do his research and doing doing it as thoroughly as he can talking to as many eyewitnesses and people with long memories as possible um and what he brings together is this really remarkable but hefty hefty chronicle about the events of the latin east and you know we don't have an original it only survives in cop in uh in copies uh, that were made in later periods and continuations um but it's an incredibly valuable document and he gives us a lot of depth and a a lot of analysis and a lot of colour for understanding the medieval world of the Crusades. I have a quick question about uh, uh, geographical terminology. In general, when we uh, read or we listen to podcasts or we watch material about the Crusades, people tend to refer to the region either with the term Middle East or more often than ever, the Holy Land. However, and I think more accurately, you use the word Ottomer which is often used by authors, but I believe it's not necessarily defined for a larger audience. So I was wondering if you can give us a sense of uh, what does Outremer mean? And, uh, you know, why you decided to use it instead of uh, the other terms? Oh, great. Well, it's, um, it's quite a common term used for describing the world of the Crusades um, and the, the Middle East in this time. And it was a word sort of created obviously by Europeans who are looking east because it comes from the French and it translates literally as the land overseas, outre-mer, so the land across the sea. And you have this great image of sort of Europeans imagining this sort of mystical holy land on the other side of the Mediterranean. So it was a term that for me was very evocative. Um, and, you know, it shares, you know, a lot of the terms we have for the Middle East are likewise defined by their relationship to Europe. So, you know, Middle East is of course a Eurocentric term that thinks talks about uh, you know the the Levantine coast as halfway, and even the even the term Levant, where we get Levantine from, you know, this comes from a word which means to rise. You know, you think of unleavened bread, unrisen bread, these sort of things. This is this word that associates this land with the sunrise and with the east. So it's, all these terms are used for people looking east, um, and likewise, you, you know, the Arabic term Mashrik comes from Sharaka, which means to rise. So it is a land associated with this with the sunrise with mystery with new dawns and for me Ultramer just seemed the appropriate term to use because especially in the context of the crusaders and the europeans who settled over there because they made this journey to the land across the sea to Ultramer, and that's what a lot of them called it themselves so let's start talking about the women the queens uh, that are described and analyzed in this book and the first character which represents sort of a first uh, uh, individual under sort of a scrutiny here is Queen Morphia. And I must admit that other than the name, I didn't know much about her, but then it turned out to be a fascinating character. Can you tell us more about Queen Morphia? Who is she and what her legacy is? Yeah, so that's a great question because Morphia is, I mean, and rightly observed by you, a very mysterious woman. We, we don't have a lot to go on. And I had my work cut out for me sort of trying to construct um, elements of her identity from the, the sparse references throughout the texts. Morphia is an Armenian princess. She's the daughter of Gabriel of Melitene, um, a, a territory in Armenia now incorporated in Turkey. Um, and she is given as, you know, has an arranged marriage with Baldwin II of Jerusalem before he becomes king of Jerusalem when he's the Count of Edessa. And she's, she's of Armenian race, but Greek Orthodox faith, which is not unusual at this time. Um, and she brings with her a very hefty dowry of 60,000 gold bezants. And we know this because William of Tyre doesn't talk about Morphia very much, but whenever he does, he's sure to mention that dowry because it's as important as she is um, in as far as he's concerned with the history of the kingdom. So Morphia becomes the Countess of Edessa when she's about 25, marrying Baldwin. And there she gives birth to her first three daughters, which are Melisande, Alice and Hodierna. During that time, her husband Baldwin is taken captive and she has to sort of hold the fort while he's gone and plays a part in negotiating his release and his ransoming. Um, she also seized her daughter's education. Then when her husband accedes to the throne of Jerusalem, we see the strength of the bond in their relationship and the esteem he holds his wife in because unlike his predecessor Baldwin I, Baldwin II delays his coronation until Morphia and his three daughters can be brought to join him in Jerusalem and they're crowned jointly in the Church of the Holy Nativity on Christmas Day. And this is very significant because this means this makes Morphia the first crowns and anointed Christian Queen of Jerusalem because 
although Baldwin I, Baldwin's second's predecessor, had wives, three in fact, he never actually bothered to have any of them crowned. So this sort of signifies a shifting role and shifting status in the, the wife of the King of Jerusalem, the Queen of Jerusalem, that Morphia becomes. And this is, you know, and this, this is taken seriously because Morphia will play a much greater role than any of her predecessors in the role of Queen, because once again, Baldwin II will be captured during his tenure as King of Jerusalem, which leaves Morphia in nominal control of some of the affairs of state and also in charge of trying to negotiate her husband's release. And the sources differ in places, but, you know, one of the key narratives is that Morphia actually arranged for a sort of a, a, a specialised hit squad of Armenian Armenian soldiers to go and ha and break Baldwin II out of jail, where he was being held by the, the Emir Balak in the fortress of Karpat. And then when Balak eventually dies, Morphia is then able to negotiate with Timotash, his successor, the release of Baldwin, but only on the condition of a hostage exchange. And Morphia actually gives her youngest daughter, the Princess Yvette, the first princess to be born to a reigning couple in Jerusalem as surety against Baldwin fulfilling the terms of his ransom. So she has a very complex story um, and, you know, has to make a lot of sacrifice in her role of queen. It must have been very, you know, heart-wrenching to give her daughter away in this way. They get her back, fortunately. Um, but yeah, she plays a key role in politics. And also I think we can assume that she must have been quite a formidable role model because each of her daughters goes on to lead a very active political career. Um, and I'm sure that given that Morphia was playing a key role in their education and upbringing, she would have influenced that. One of the interesting aspects uh, gathering, you know, uh, gathered reading your book is that there's a general sense that Latin Christianity and Greek Orthodox Christianity were unmixed at that time. There was a conflict between the two. But reading the stories of these women, you, you actually get to see that, as you mentioned at the very beginning, talking about uh, Morphia, that the two faiths are coming together so that there is a degree of intermarriage and degree of coexistence between the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox. And before talking to other women, I was wondering if you had the same sense too. Yeah, exactly. I think intermarriage between crusaders and native born Christians is actively encouraged particularly for political purposes. And, you know, we see we see political marriages, not just between the Counts of Edessa, the Kings of Jerusalem and Armenian princesses um, of Greek Orthodox and Armenian faith, but, you know, also crucially between the monarchs of the Latin East, their daughters and the Byzantine Empire. I mean, some of the most important political marriages made during this period are between Kings of Jerusalem and princesses of Byzantium. Um, so we, we do see a, a, a lot of intermarriage and encourage cooperation between uh, different denominations of Christianity, for sure. Let me go back to Alice, the, the second daughter of uh, uh, Queen Morphia. Now, while Hollywood focused on Sibylla in a movie that we're going to talk about, uh, Alice could actually be a very interesting character for any Hollywood movie. She has a fascinating story of rebellion. And, and I was wondering if you can briefly tell us who is Alice and why she ended up rebelling against their own family, essentially. Oh yeah, Alice is Alice is a difficult one. She's always seen as, as the problem child in this dynasty, which is a shame, but you know, uh, probably accurate to a degree. Yes, Alice is the second daughter of Morphia of Melitene and her husband Baldwin II. She's born in the county of Edessa, like her older sister Melisande. And when her, par her father becomes King of Jerusalem, she travels with her mother and sisters to Jerusalem to be present at his coronation. Melisande, her older sister, isn't the first sister to marry because she is being groomed to be heiress to the kingdom and they're waiting for the right time and the right match for her whereas in contrast Alice the second daughter is married off quite young she's in her late teens when she's married to Beaumont of Taranto well Beaumont the second of Taranto the heir of the famous Beaumont who was the hero of the first crusade and Beaumont comes he's been raised in southern Italy and then eventually again in his late late teens he comes across to Outremer to claim his inheritance as a prince of Antioch and one of the things that seals the deal of his alliance with the King of Jerusalem is a marriage to Alice, the Princess of Jerusalem, which makes her Princess of Antioch, but only by marriage. She's not a princess regnant in that sense. The marriage starts quite well. Alice and, Bald uh, Alice and Beaumont have a daughter very quickly. Her name is Constance. She's named Constance for Beaumont's mother. 
And but then very shortly after that, Bohemond the second is killed in battle and his head is cut off and it's sent to the Caliph of Baghdad as a sort of grisly trophy. And this leaves Alice in the centre of this quite dramatic power vacuum. But the Prince of Antioch, who's just arrived, you know, a year or so ago, is suddenly dead. And who is going to rule Antioch? And for, you know, probably a variety of reasons, Alice does not want to either be returned to Jerusalem or forced to marry someone else straight away. Either she's mourning her husband, maybe she's not, but for whatever reason, she does not want to suddenly give up the independence she's she's gained and the chance for independence that she now has. And she wants to seize, she wants to seize the Principality of Antioch for herself and for her daughter and rule as regent for her daughter. Now, legally, this should be possible, but perhaps fair enough, the King of Jerusalem doesn't want his teenage daughter ruling Antioch, which is an important and unstable frontier territory. So Baldwin's plan is to take control of the principality himself and marry and probably marry Alice off very quickly to a trusted lieutenant, a trusted lieutenant who can rule Antioch stably on behalf of Jerusalem and, and keep keep the border secure. Alice isn't having any of this. And there's a there's a number of different rumors as to how she goes about achieving her ends. But what, and one of them suggests that she even sends an, an embassy to the Turkish Atabeg Zengi asking him for assistance fighting the king of Jerusalem unfortunately well fortunately or unfortunately depending on your perspective the embassy is intercepted by her father who when he learns of it he tortures the man to death and all these things and then marches on Antioch with haste and besieges the city and eventually Alice is forced to come out and prostrate herself before him and ask for forgiveness and surprisingly or you know he he's Baldwin deals quite leniently with this with his recalcitrant daughter um, and although she's banished from Antioch and separated from her daughter, which is obviously very difficult, she's allowed to retain her dower lands of Latakia and Jabala and the Syrian coast. Um, and some historians are inclined to see this as Baldwin being lenient, but others are inclined to say, well, actually, you know, he was just following the letter of the law. He had no legal rights to deprive Alice of these lands, but potentially as a rebel, he could have. So, um, but then, you know, Alice's story is not over there. She will rebel twice more. Once a very significant rebellion, she will ally with Pons of Tripoli and Jocelyn of Edessa, and they will sort of form a, a league against the King of Jerusalem, who by this point is Fulk of Anjou, ruling as King of Jerusalem. And this is part of a wider bid for the Crusader states to assert their independence from the Kingdom of Jerusalem. They don't want to acknowledge the suzerain suzerainty of the Kings of Jerusalem. They want to be independent states as they were when they were founded by the original Crusaders. Um, and these bonds of loyalty would usually be negotiated on a sort of person to person basis. Would this King of Jerusalem command the loyalty of this prince or princess of Antioch? Um, but by, by the time they rebel, there seems to have been this pattern established where the Kings of Jerusalem expect the submission of the surrounding territories. And obviously these princes don't want to accept that. Their fathers might have, but these men, they, they, don't, they don't feel the need to submit in order to retain their territory. So this leads to this rebellion, which is very dramatic, but ultimately, Folk of Jerusalem is successful in suppressing it, and Alice finds herself in disgrace once again. Her last rebellion is perhaps her most dramatic, um, because her brother-in-law Folk sort of plays the long game and allows her to get some traction in Antioch and sort of declare herself the ruler um, and close the city against him. And then, as part of this sort of pre-arranged backstairs intrigue plan, Raymond de Poitiers, a handsome young knight from France, arrives at the gates of Antioch and asks Alice, you know, let me in, we can get married, we'll be in a good position to rule together, I'll let you have a certain degree of independence, we can rule together, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Alice, probably thinking that the odds of her holding out for very long are slim, accepts this offer, lets Raymond into the city, and then in some sort of prearranged skullduggery, while Alice is making preparations for the wedding, he actually kidnaps her eight-year-old daughter and marries her instead. And this is a dramatic defeat for Alice, because not only has her daughter been kidnapped and married by this man, but also this subverts Alice completely out of the line of succession and the right to rule Jerusalem. Alice is only, uh, the right to rule Antioch. Alice's only claim to rule the Antioch was as regent for her daughter. But now that her daughter has a husband, that husband has the right to rule as regent or on behalf of her daughter, Constance. So Alice is now cut out of the line of success entirely and leaves Antioch in disgrace. And we think she dies soon after because we don't hear of her in the Chronicles again. So she disappears from the chronicle essentially in the end. Exactly. Yeah. After that, after that third and final defeat, she disappears from the historical record. On the other hand, uh, let's talk about now Melisand. 
So mm. let me skip forward a few centuries. In the 1920s, when the British took over uh, Palestine and made Jerusalem the, sort of the, the capital of uh, British mandatory Palestine, they also adopted a number of measures, one that included the renaming of the streets of a city. Under the Ottomans, see, uh, streets didn't really have a, a name. They were just known according to a particular building or a, a church, a location, or even some people living on that particular street. And when the governor of Jerusalem assembled the committee, obviously they came up with a list, and that list included plenty of men. And there's only one woman that was mentioned, and that was Queen Melisent. Now, to many, Queen Melisande was obviously known, but to many, she was not. And so, who was Queen Melisande? Well, Queen Melisande is the central figure of my book, and she's the most important crusader queen of Jerusalem in the 12th century, and she has a prolific influence and legacy um, during her lifetime and after it. Melisande is the eldest daughter of Baldwin II and Morphe of Melitine, and on her father's death, she inherits power in Jerusalem jointly with her husband and son. This is unexpected. Melisande has been being recognized as the heiress to the kingdom in legal documents running up to her father's death for many years, but she is married to this magnate from France, Fulke of Anjou, who her father sort of imports as an appropriate husband for her because he has crusading experience, he has, le he has leadership skills, he has a large army, he's wealthy, he's an experienced soldier. So all in all, he seems like a good fit for this military kingdom. However, on his deathbed, Baldwin makes a specific change to his will, which says that power will not be left only to his new son-in-law, Fulk, as Fulk doubtless expects, but will instead be split in a triumvirate between Fulk, Melisande, and their baby son, the future Baldwin III. So Melisande is the first, through this change to the will, Melisande becomes the first queen regnant of Jerusalem because she inherits the authority to rule in her own right, not through her husband and not as not as a supporter or consort, but as a ruling queen herself. And this this changes history and has a huge impact on medieval queenship across the world, actually. Um, and it follows a very interesting parallel to Matilda of England, who is left power in a similar way, but failed well left authority in a similar way, but fails to convert into tangible power and leads to the anarchy in England because there's so much resistance to her rule. Whereas Melisande in this very unstable crusader kingdom and commanding different factions of loyalty due to her mixed heritage and her sort of crusader pedigree, Melisande does actually have enough support in the end to rule as a monarch in this time. She has a very difficult start to her reign. Her husband does initially try to cut her out of government. Um, and eventually, you know, it takes a, a rebellion that almost leads, leads to civil war for Melisande to actually be given the power to which she is entitled. Um, and there's a lot of smears thrown around Melisande at this time surrounding this event, uh, this rebellion led by her cousin, Hugh of Jaffa, including that Hugh of Jaffa and Melisande are actually having like an incestuous affair. They were cousins. Um, but there's no support to back this up. William of Tyre just reports the gossip that was circulating at the time. Um, and it's much more likely, in fact, that this, this rebellion was not provoked by some sort of love affair. It was actually provoked by a desire to subvert folks authority to curtail folks authority in the kingdom and make sure that Melisande and the local barons of Outremer were given were given their say in government following this Melisande does really assert herself and she becomes the senior partner in her relationship with folk and both independently and together they undertake a lot of architectural projects which in, is no doubt actually why the street in Jerusalem was named after her because a lot of the old city of Jerusalem that we see today certainly the medieval portions so bear Melisande's mark um, the, the triple covered market was constructed during Melisande's reign. She made the, the street of Malquisinat, the street of bad cooking, um, to sort of, you know, improve the infrastructure for pilgrims and spiritual, spiritual tourists in the old city at this time. She also to, undertook serious renovation projects to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is still visible today. So she made a big mark on, on, the, face of, on the face of Jerusalem. Um, but on top of this, her, her husband died midway through her reign, and she continued to rule after his death as regent for her son and then jointly with him when he came of age until he eventually went to war with her and ousted her from power because he wanted to rule the whole kingdom himself. And it was actually amazing that Melisande managed to cling on to power for as long as she did. Um, but yeah, a tireless patron of arts and architecture. Um, she played a you know, serious role in military and strategic decisions for the kingdom. You know, We know she was on the war council at the Council of Palmyra near Acre when deciding where to 
where to send the armies of the Second Crusade. And we know she had significant influence with the church and with the Templar orders as well. So she was a woman who wielded a lot of power during her lifetime and really, really changed the game for, for medieval queenship. I remember reading a book some time ago, probably a long time ago, uh, because I was fascinated by some questions of a, a, you know, Jerusalem uh, during the Crusader period. And I, and I remember there was a chapter written by a scholar, Sarah Lambert, Queen or Consort, Rulership and Politics in the Latin East. And so I was wondering, and you talk about this in the book, uh, you know, making a distinction between being the consort, so not really with a real power, or being regnant, so actually having power. So if you have to trace sort of, a, if you have to give some sort of, a, in a nutshell, uh, you know, a judgment about uh, Melisande, was she in the end uh, a queen or she ended up being a consort? Melisande, there's no doubt about it. Melisande was 100% a queen. Um, she was queen regnant. Um, she wielded a lot of power. Her husband did not, after following the rebellion that we've talked about, her husband did not pass laws without her consent. They were, they were a joint partnership. And when her son, even when he was of age, wanted to take power and rule Jerusalem, she had so much authority within the kingdom that it took, you know, it took him going to war with her to topple her from power. So, you no, know, she was an incredibly powerful figure ruling with as much power as a king. Um, and we even, you know, we have letters from Bernard, the abbot of Calavaux, writing to her, telling her to put her hand to strong things and be a man in a woman. Um, and to, you know, use her faith in God to let her rule uh, the kingdom. So 100% queen, regnant, not consort. I'm curious about something that perhaps you can elaborate on. I mean, obviously she was a woman in a male-dominated world. How do you think she managed to uh, gain loyalty and make sure that actually she had a strong number of followers and that would obey her laws and commands? Well, I actually think the strongest thing here is sheer force of personality and personal capabilities. Melisande was without doubt an intelligent, determined and tenacious woman. Um, and we can see that by what she achieved in her lifetime. And I you know what I've, I wouldn't take an argument that, I mean, even with all the natural, or even with all the political advantages that Melisande had, which I'll come on to in a sec, she would not have been able to carve out the role of herself that she did without serious personal ability. And people respond to that now and then forceful personalities can achieve things um so i think that that's a key part of it um but you know on top of that she is well situated she is well positioned to to take power and command loyalty in in the crusader kingdom she is you know she's born in odessa to an armenian mother but a here but also her father's a hero of the first crusade so she has sort of pedigree on both sides you know she's crusader pedigree but also She's of Armenian ethnicity and Greek Orthodox race. So she is this uniting figure, a uh, Greek Orthodox faith. So she is this uniting, uniting figure of the many different factions living within the very multicultural center of Jerusalem. And, you know, she's been born and bred in Utremer. And as I mentioned before, her father has been, like, you know, has been proclaiming her heiress to the kingdom from a young age. And she's been sitting on, sitting in on high council meetings since her teens. So she is well known, well respected and well positioned to command loyalty within the kingdom. On top of this, she's quite a savvy ruler. You know, she makes grants of land to the right people, gives tax breaks to the right people. You know, she gives benefits to the Templars, all these sorts of things. So she does, her, her, her donations to the church, you know, her, her renovations of the Holy Sepulcher, her construction of the Convent of Bethany, all of these things, they ingratiate her with her with the patriarch of Jerusalem, who will then be her staunch ally. So not only it's it's her personal abilities, um, the political position she was left in by her father, and then also you know playing the the game of politics very well and giving to the right causes, giving to the right people, um, and wi winning win winning and retaining loyalty from key from key individuals. It was indeed a fascinating figure, and just by the fact that there are many volumes dedicated to her, and many with different uh, ideas and theories, shows that she's also a controversial character, and certainly one that has been misunderstood and described in different ways uh, throughout history. I want to ask you something about Sibylla. Now, Sibylla has been portrayed in a famous Hollywood movie in the early 2000s, uh, Kingdom of Heaven, and uh, Certainly, the, the, the historical representation in that movie is rather wrong, I would say. 
uh, even though there are certain elements about the personality and the character and probably the strength that are somehow representing who uh, she was. And Sibylla is also linked with uh, essentially the end of uh, Crusader Jerusalem. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who was Sibylla? Yeah, Sibylla is a really great figure. She's the actually the granddaughter of Queen Melisande. She's the daughter of her set of Melisande's second son, King Amalric of Jerusalem. And as shown in the Kingdom of Heaven, she's the sister of Baldwin IV, otherwise known as the Leper King. So she's a very interesting figure who comes to the throne of Jerusalem, sort of over the bodies of her her brother, her, her husband, her son, her father. So you know, she's she comes to the throne at a very difficult time after a lot of personal trauma. Um, and she's presented very negatively in the Chronicles and very positively at various points. At some point, you know, I think in the 17th century, a rumor sneaks into the narrative that Sibylla actually poisoned her own son in order to take the throne. But that's that's not really attested to in any medieval documents. So no idea where that came from. Whereas other documents, they hold Sibylla up as this sort of paragon of wifely virtue because she sort of sticks to her husband like glue. Um, and, you know, when when he's when when Saladin is you know purportedly holding a knife to his throat telling her to uh, to to surrender the fortress of Ascalon apparently she does save her husband's life and she submits to her husband in lots of ways so she's often held up as this ideal wife but so her, her legacy is mixed I think it's interesting that you bring up Kingdom of Heaven um, a film I personally love despite its inaccuracies um, because what I see when I look at the portrayal of Sibylla in that film is actually a, an attempt to meld the storylines and personalities of Sibylla and Melisande. Um, because a lot of the drama that we see there, this, this affair, this attempt to supplant her husband, to take power herself, Sibylla representing the local baronage and their interests against this interloping. I mean, it's Guy de Lusignan in the film, but you know, Guy, there are parallels to be drawn between the storyline given to Sibylla and Guy and the story, the real storyline in the Chronicles of Melisande and Folk and Hugh of Jaffa, the the cousin we mentioned earlier. So the, the film is quite interesting in that respect in that it brings these elements of different generations together into sort of one mega drama, but no, very historically inaccurate. Um, Sibylla, I don't think is the powerful figure that Eva Green portrays her as. Um, Sibylla is an interesting figure. She definitely plays a role in the, well, arguably plays a role in the siege of Jerusalem, some in the final siege, some sources situate her there play, playing a commanding role, others, Put her far away so she, that her legacy is shrouded in mystery um but you know to learn more about Sibylla I really recommend turning to a new book recently released by Helen Nicholson she's written a great new biography of Sibylla um who she just calls Sybil of course um and that's that's a very very valuable resource for understanding Sibylla's life and legacy um but essentially yes she's the the crusade she's the queen of Jerusalem who presides over the kingdom as it falls apart as Jerusalem is conquered by Saladin. She's queen at the Battle of Hattin, where her husband leads the armies of Jerusalem to annihilation. She, and then she then defends Jerusalem without an army against the approaching forces of Saladin and plays a role in negotiating the release of the survivors in the city and the, allowing them to purchase their freedom. After that, she, again, she returns to her husband's side and eventually dies in the, the camp besieging Acre, waiting for Coeur de Lyon, Richard the Lionheart, to arrive and take acre so a very unfortunate life um and she, you know she might have done a much better job as queen as she'd had she not come at such a such a terrible time in the the politics of the kingdom of jerusalem i must say that uh, uh sibylla holds some um, historical value in italian history because uh her son baldwin um that she had with the first uh, husband william on montferrat and was it some sort of a, in line with what then became the uh, Italian monarchy in the 19th century. And ever since they claim direct uh, uh, connection to the kingdom of Jerusalem, and also they use the title occasionally as being the kings of Jerusalem. So it's a very yeah. interesting and fascinating story. I've seen that in some tombs. I've always wondered how these people claim to have the queen of Jerusalem or king of Jerusalem, but now, now I know it's very interesting. One of the most interesting aspects of your book is also the fact that you talk about marriage. You provide a lot of details about uh, the married life of these women, which is often forgotten and neglected, but you actually go into the details, trying to dig into you know, the question of a happiness, whether actually a good marriage influence also the politics and the role of these women. 
And, and I guess the source is still William of Tyre. And I was wondering to what extent for you is important to talk about uh, their married life. Um, I think, you know, women and chronicles are often only talked about in regard to their marriage. And, you know, this, this is important, you know, often this is necessary because we don't have a lot of details about other aspects of their lives. Um, so I think, it, you know, I, I just felt it would be a mistake to overlook that, that key role that women did play in the medieval period, which was as wives and mothers. Um, and their marriages do have, you know, the, the happiness or not of their marriages do have a political impact. Yeah, so the happiness or not of these women's marriages do affect the politics and the military positions of the day. So, for example, the difficulties between Melisande and Fulk in the early years of their marriage, as Melisande vied for power, those were affairs of state that they were incredibly important and influenced not only affairs in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but also the, you know, the face of medieval queenship. Maybe if Melisande had not had to struggle against Fulk, she would not have been able to become such a powerful queen. So that has a serious impact on queenship. Additionally, her sister Hodierna had a very difficult marriage with her husband in Tripoli, Raymond of Tripoli, um, and he was eventually assassinated. Some even whispered that Hodierna was behind the assassination. So, you know, this, I mean, it, this, William of Tyre says he was killed by the assassins, but there were rumours that maybe Hodierna was involved and actually he was assassinated directly after a major spat between them and Hodierna had actually just left him and left Tripoli to go down to Jerusalem to be with her sister so these difficulties in marriages did have serious ramifications and reverberations throughout the political sphere of the Latin East and so I think it would have been a mistake to overlook them. I have one last question so we talked about some of these women I left out Eleanor of Wacky Twain um, even though she's a fascinating figure, you know, she was the Queen of France and eventually she traveled also to, uh, uh, to the Latin East. Is there anything that we didn't talk about, but you want to uh, highlight in this last part of the interview? Oh, well, with regard to Anna Rakuten, I mean, yeah, she's, she's a difficult figure in my book. She's not a natural fit in that she's not a native born queen in Outremer. She, but she is one of the first crusader queens. She's the queen of France who goes on crusade with her husband, Louis. And I think she has a very interesting experience in the East. I'm not going to talk in the time we have left about her alleged affair with her uncle. That's just another example of historiography, I think, playing against women. And we, we, we will never know the truth or falsehood of that allegation. But what I think is very interesting is that well, when Eleanor reaches Jerusalem after her brief spell in Antioch um, and the war councils convene to decide what the armies, including the army of Eleanor's vassals, the, you know, including the Aquitanian forces, what their target will be in the Second Crusade, William of Tyre provides this very exhaustive list of who's present at the war council at Palmyra. And although Melisande is on that list, Eleanor is not. So I think actually that, sh that shows a very, a very interesting piece of information about Melisande's role as queen in contrast to Eleanor's and how Melisande, even though she and Eleanor theoretically should have had a similar amount of power, Eleanor was being excluded and Melisande was being allowed to wield this power. And this, I think, shows the different environments of European and of European and Middle Eastern society at this time, that Melisande was able to take this power and Eleanor was excluded from it at that point. And I think that that experience um, of being excluded while Melisande wasn't probably did influence Eleanor's later career and her desire to sort of assert herself politically in both England and France. Well, I take advantage of a spin-off question. It looks like there was a moment in history in the Latin East where women were able to actually exercise power where you don't see that much in European history more or less at the same time women as you said are excluded from power is that a unique combination of geography history characters personality or it's something else I think it's not quite unique because we do see we do see examples of women certainly striving and sometimes succeeding to claim power in Europe at this time, Araka in Spain and uh, in Matilda in England, she's much less successful, but to a degree, the parallels are there. I, but I, I do think there is something very interesting there, which is this combination of political instability, these very driven and ambitious women, um, and just the, the geographical elements that combine to allow these women to take power. And also the main one there that we're overlooking is the genetics. I mean, more, more women were born at this time. I mean, the Baldwin II the second had four daughters and this is significant. And then also Amalric of Jerusalem, he had a son and two daughters. 
but the son contracted leprosy and died in his early 20s. So it's, it's also this, 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 um, you, this rare lack of male heirs that allows the women to drive into these opportunities and to be put in these positions. And it's also, as I say, it's the geographical element of the Middle East. There, there aren't loads and loads of eligible cousins waiting sort of in the next county. Um, and there's an urgency as well, because these are kingdoms forged in a hostile territory with enemies pressing in from all sides. They don't have the luxury of civil war between themselves to decide who the next king will be. If they were to do that, it wouldn't be the case of one faction triumphing over the other. It would be the collapse of the entire society. So I think it is this, and it, yeah, these elements do combine to create this, this very rare environment, which allowed a lot of women to take power at, at, at the same time, yeah. It was Catherine Pangonis, author of Queens of Jerusalem, The Women Who Dare to Rule. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.